Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar FirstNet and its significance to state DOT operations and safety programs. My name is Nilu Parvanashtiani and I'll be helping with facilitating today's webinar. This webinar is sponsored by the ASHTO Committee on Transportation System Operations and hosted by the National Operations Center of Excellence, also known as NOCO. Um, just a quick reminder, if you don't know NOCO, um, we offer resources to support the transportation system management and operations community. So if you look at your screen right now, on the right side you see a pod that's called useful links box. So you can browse uh, through like, um, you know, NOCO links for Gizmo resources and news. Um, below that pod, there is uh, another pod called download pod. You can um, download the PDF of today's presentation along with some supporting material from there. Uh, this screen will be shown uh, here at the beginning and then we'll come back here at you in Q&A. Um, a few other logistics for today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded and that recording along with the presentation slides will be available through the on-demand learning section of NOCO website within 48 hours. All the attendee phones are on listen-only mode, but please uh, stay engaged with us throughout the webinar by putting in your comments and questions in the question discussion part. Uh, we, we have dedicated time uh, at the end for a Q&A session where uh, the moderator will, will read each question out loud and the presenters uh, will answer each question. So as those questions come to your mind during the each presentation, please uh, just put them in that question discussion part. So that is all I had. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to our moderator, Ross Buchholz, to start us off. Ross? Thanks, Nilu. And good afternoon and good morning to those out in Mountain and Pacific time zones. And welcome to this webinar, which is hosted by the National Operations Center of Excellence, that will feature FirstNet and its significance to the state DOT operations and safety activities. My name is Russ Buchholz. I'm the Strategy Innovation Director at the State of North Dakota DOT, and I am also uh, the current co-vice chair for the AASHTO Committee on Transportation System Operations, and I'm, I'm also represented on AASHTO on the First FirstNet Public Safety Advisory Committee. I'll be moderating today's webinar. FirstNet, or the, the First Responder Network Authority, is an independent entity within the U.S. Department of Commerce, established to help address service issues and challenges with communication systems used by our public safety entities. Today's webinar is intended to provide information about FirstNet and its capabilities to the support DOT operations through cellular for voice and data communications. This webinar was organized by the AASHTO Working Group on Communications Technology, a working group within the Committee on Transportation System Operations. At this time, I'd like to introduce Fernand Milanis of Caltrans who is a co-chair of the Communication Technology Working Group. Ferdinand will pro provide some background on the working group before I introduce the rest of the webinar speakers. A little bio on Ferdinand is Ferdinand Milanis manages the Caltrans Public Safety Communication Systems, responsible for planning, design, management, operation, and maintenance of a two-way LMR, or land mobile radio, satellite, wired, and wireless communication systems. Go ahead, Ferdinand. Thank you, Russ. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, as Russ mentioned, uh, my name is Ferdinand Milanis from Caltrans, co-chair of our communications working group. I also want to uh, recognize Janet Frankel from Maryland DOT, who, along with me, co-chairs our working, working group. So briefly today, I would just like to tell you about our working group and ask those involvement in communications-related activities. So our working group focuses on current and emerging trends in communications technologies that better support DOT operations, and those include land mobile radio, fiber optic, micro radio, cellular, 5G. And we also assist ASHTO with developing responses to notice of pr proposed rulemakings by the FCC or the implementation of FCC mandates. Uh, members of our committee also represent ASHTO and national committees, as we feel it is important that transportation needs to be a part of the conversation whenever rules, guidelines, or regulations are being planned and adopted with regards to communications. As Russ mentioned, um, PSAC 
is the, an advisory group to FirstNet that provides user feedback um, to FirstNet. Uh, LMCC, SafeCom, NIPSTIC are public safety practitioner organizations that discuss technical, government, and operations of our communication systems. Um, we also um, partner with the Transportation Re Research Board, um, National Cooperation of Highway Research Program, um, to sponsor and provide uh, panelists to their uh, research projects. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm very excited to announce that our communications guidebook is very close to being completed, and we hope to share that with all of you. Our, our work group meets every other month, which uh, provides a forum for our members to, to voice their concerns, needs, share, share best practices. We have invited uh, subject matter experts from both the private industry and government to those topics that, are, that the state, state DOTs are, are interested in. So please reach out to me, Janet or Venkat, if you would like to be added to our working group. We really welcome as much state participation as we can. Some of you are not aware, ASHTO is one of the four designated radio frequency coordinators in the United States. Simply put, an RF, an RF or radio frequency coordinator starts and completes the process for applying and obtaining an FCC license to enable the operation of radio communications within a specified radio spectrum. Um, a license ensures that systems can operate and coexist without interfering with each other. And just as important, a license gives us, you, an the ownership of that specific spectrum. Some examples of uh, DOT applications that require licenses, highway advisory radios. Uh, some of your states are, are, are implementing connected vehicles. Those require uh, licensing. Electronic toll collection. Um, here in California, the, the past five years, we had severe drought. So we have, we have begun installing smart irrigation controllers. Those require radio system licenses. And maybe we haven't thought about this um, in transportation, but we need to look at radio spectrum as an asset, just like our TMS our field elements, our, our cameras, our highway advisor radios, our, our heavy equipment, graders, loaders, snow plows. As, as, as you may be aware, the FCC often auctions radio spectrum to AT&T, Verizon, and other um, cellular providers, and which garners billions for, for, for the FCC. The DOTs that own and have their own licenses for their radio system, microwave or, or, or two-way land mobile radio. Th those licenses, that radio spectrum is yours, and that is worth a significant amount, close to maybe millions of dollars, uh, depending on how much bandwidth you own. So our radio spectrum must be thought of as an asset and also must be protected to the best we can. As I mentioned, ASTO is one of the RF frequency coordinators. Uh, we did a poll, a survey of all the states, and 14 states use ASTO for their RF frequency coordination needs. And some of those needs, licensing for their two-way LMR systems, microwave radio systems, capacity planning, and DSRC and ITS, or connected vehicle deployment. Um, and of those polled, those who are using um, ASTO as their RF frequency coordinator, have, have stated that they've been really satisfied with ASTO's services and that they have met their needs. So, how, so if you have any local, part, if you or I know of any local partners that are, are, are requiring a RF coordination, please mention ASTO as one of the prospective service providers. So, how do we obtain uh, RF coordination services from ASTO? So, ASTO works with RadioSoft, who does all our radio frequency planning, radio frequency uh, analysis and submittals to the FCC. Uh, our, our contact at uh, RadioSoft is Michael Henderson. Um, Michael has been really a good friend of our communications work group. He's a great resource for us, and uh, we're really happy that uh, ASHA has been able to partner with RadioSoft. Um, if you need uh, any information or have questions about um, uh, ASHA's RF frequency coordination program, please contact Venkat. And again, just want to reiterate, reiterate if you would like to be added or interested in added to our communications work group distribution list, please reach out to me, me, Janet, or Venkat. Uh, thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Russ. Thanks, Bernad. In the first part of this webinar, Kenzie Capiz from FirstNet will provide an overview of the FirstNet authority, including the status of the network build-out and services available for the state and local transportation agencies. The next we'll have is Ryan Polterman from Comdex 
who will share details about FirstNet's technical capabilities. And then finally, we'll have Janet Fanko from Maryland DOT State Highway Administration and Dave Chase from New Hampshire DOT will provide an overview of their experiences using FirstNet to support DOT operations. Feel free to submit questions in the chat box throughout the webinar. Uh, we'll have one time for one or two questions after each presentation, and then at the, at the end of the webinar, there will be plenty of time for a question and answer session that will be led by myself, Ferdinand, Janet, uh, um, from then on. So thank you. So, uh, okay. so, our, our, so today's first speaker is Kenzie Capiz from FirstNet. Kenzie has been a FirstNet authority for the last four and a half years. In this role, she primarily administers the Public Safety Advisory Committee by coordinating with public safety associations and leadership across the country and within all disciplines of public safety. Prior to FirstNet, Kenzie worked at the Department of Homeland Security Legacy Office of Emergency Communications and previously consulted for the DHS Office of Infrastructure Protection. Kenzie, go ahead. Thanks so much, Russ. Uh, thanks, everybody, for having me here today. Um, I'll just do a quick mic check and make sure that you can hear me clearly. Loud and clear. Thank you. Uh, so, again, thank you. Um, I really appreciate all of the collaboration, um, both with Ashto from a, a PSAC perspective, um, and I'm really glad to be with the uh, committee today to give a little bit more background on the FirstNet Authority itself uh, and also on our current work. Um, I know that one of the big things we hear a lot about are questions about the differences among the FirstNet Authority, the FirstNet Network, and AT&T FirstNet. So I'm hoping to go through a bit of our organization's history, uh, the status of the network, uh, as well as some features, uh, and highlight some of our current outreach with public safety uh, around the FirstNet Authority roadmap to answer those questions. Uh, so per the agenda, we'll be here for a little bit afterwards to um, answer some Q&A, uh, and we also have Jackie Miller-Waring, um, our Director of Field Operations for the Central Region, uh, here today. Uh, so again, I'll be highlighting uh, two of my favorite things to discuss, uh, both the recent network enhancements and some of the upgrades, uh, which are derived from our work with public safety, uh, collecting input from across the country, and translating that input directly into features uh, that ensure that this network is made for public safety. Um, I also have some information on our deployable program that I understand is of interest to the group. Uh, so with that, I will jump right in. Uh, so really, uh, FirstNet was born out of 9-11. Uh, as this slide shows, the attacks uh, really brought to the forefront uh, the many communications challenges that first responders face during emergencies and disasters of all types. Uh, these issues were captured in the 9-11 Commission Report, uh, which identified these gaps uh, and recommended the creation of a single nationwide network to enhance the communications that are used by all public safety personnel that day. So we've really come a long way uh, since that initial idea of a national broadband network gained momentum. And fortunately, uh, all the major public safety organizations and associations uh, that were united in their push for a dedicated uh, wireless network are still with us today. Uh, so their advocacy efforts uh, before Congress really led to the creation of FirstNet and the network uh, in 2012, uh, wherein the FirstNet authority was given the spectrum and tasked with creating and managing the building and deployment of the NPSBN. Uh, so from that point on, we laid extensive groundwork uh, from our creation, sharing starting, excuse me, uh, with the governors identifying the state single points of contact, uh, or the SPOCs, as many of you know them, uh, and working with them to conduct initial consultation in all 56 states and territories. Um, so these initial consultations uh, and also the early data collection uh, efforts enabled us to develop uh, an objective-based RFP, which was released in 2016, and we all now know that was awarded to AT&T in March of 2017. So once that was awarded, uh, I think Jackie can attest to this, uh, our team really hit the ground running uh, with the development and then subsequent release of the state plans over the course of the summer of 2017. 
Uh, we feel that this was another great collaborative step um, as our field team was able to meet with all of the SPOCs um, and their SPOC teams and the state plan review teams to discuss the draft plans and work together on each state and territory's very unique needs in this network. So after all this work and I think seemingly millions of miles flown on planes, uh, we are incredibly proud to say that all 56 governors opted into the RAN plan, or the Radio Access Network plan, uh, which enabled AT&T to almost immediately begin building out the first net network across the country. Um, so since that milestone, uh, the first new authority has been able to pivot our focus to our current mission, which is public safety advocacy. Um, not coincidentally, that is, that is our team's name and our mission. Um, so as you can see on this right-hand column, uh, on the slide, our team of public safety experts, leaders, uh, and practitioners is really uniquely responsible uh, for engaging public safety across all the disciplines and geographical areas uh, to, con to continue to evolve this network. Uh, we're proud to say that FirstNet is now a reality, and in addition to overseeing the contract, uh, the FirstNet Authority is focused on ensuring public safety gets the most out of this network. Um, so I'm also going to go a little bit into um, both of those pieces in the following slides. So the first element here um, is that partnership between the FirstNet Authority and AT&T FirstNet. Uh, no other network has the structure or guaranteed public safety what FirstNet does. We're very proud uh, to differentiate ourselves from every other network through this partnership and the great work done on both sides of it. Uh, I like to outline this as kind of a Venn diagram um, with the commonality between the two sides of this unique public-private partnership being the FirstNet network itself. The, uh, the aim uh, or arm each side of uh, the partnership has its own responsibilities and roles, right? Uh, so we at the FirstNet Authority provide the oversight of all aspects of the 25-year contract, uh, including the five-year build-out, as well as technical expertise an innovation and strategy for the required reinvestment into the network, uh, which I'll get more into in just a bit. Uh, then AT&T is solely responsible for the building and now, of course, the maintenance of the nationwide core, uh, which is physically redundant and is a one-of-its-kind public safety network core, uh, as well as the RAN, or again, radio access network, uh, build out in each state, and the adoption and customer care uh, that comes with that. So the advantages of a partner like AT&T um, include things like their global security operations, um, the app, uh, device uh, ecosystems that they were able to bring to the table uh, right from the get-go. Uh, and because the, uh, really the, the billions of dollars um, of network and assets that they bring, we are able to already have an incredibly robust uh, approach to really transforming public safety communications. So diving a little bit uh, into what this partnership means and, and really what it is, um, first that is here, and, and we are proud to say that we will modernize public safety and emergency communications by delivering specialized features that public safety has asked for. Uh, these include priority, resiliency, coverage, and 24-7 uh, dedicated customer service. All of this is tailored for public safety. Um, the modernized aspect of the network is most easily reflected, I think, um, in the device and the app ecosystem. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the NIST list, uh, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, they were tasked in our enabling legislation uh, with maintaining the list of FirstNet uh, devices. So the most recent iteration of the list was actually just earlier this month. Uh, it is version 27, and it contains 205 devices 151 of which support band 14, which is the spectrum that FirstNet Authority owns. Um, the list has really grown exponentially in the last few years, and it includes kind of a wide array of, of things uh, from phones to tablets to routers, um, all available for the many different uses uh, and needs of, across public safety. Um, the second piece of this uh, is the cybersecurity aspect that I mentioned uh, just a minute ago. Um, the AT&T security and network operations is, is really world class um, and combined, you know, that with the, the priority and the preemption of the FirstNet network, uh, we feel and that FirstNet really is a network uh, truly, you know, of its own. It is dedicated and specialized for public safety. Um, so lastly, I'm here um, 
this slide mentions the kind of aggressive pricing and dedicated public safety help desk. Um, more detail on all of this can be found at firstnet.com. Um, I encourage everybody to visit you know, that website for customer care or more information on the AT&T FirstNet program. So all this to say, really, um, our role in the partnership is to do just this, what's on this slide, advance the FirstNet experience. FirstNet Authority's goal is really to serve as a catalyst for public safety innovation uh, and to educate and advocate for public safety needs. So in order to do this, we need strong relationships at really all levels. Um, the FirstNet Authority plays a unique role in kind of seeking and channeling uh, the needs of public safety directly into the network uh, through this engage, develop, invest, collaborate approach that you see here. Uh, our team is able to, again, collect data to clearly demonstrate where the network advancements should be focused and where the resources, including investment dollars, uh, should be prioritized. Um, our team conducts an array of engagements around this FirstNet roadmap, uh, which we developed in conjunction with public safety industry and of course, as I'm partial to highlighting, um, our Public Safety Advisory, or, or PSAC, um, of which we think Russ is a fantastic member. Um, these engagements really increase our opportunities for that relationship building with public safety stakeholders, um, and we believe that they, in turn, are then able to, to help us um, in becoming kind of force multipliers for FirstNet success. Um, so as a result of these functions, uh, we not only serve to influence our relationships uh, with public safety, but also to then influence the successful, successful implementation um, and eventual evolution of the FirstNet solutions via this roadmap. So I, I keep mentioning this roadmap. Um, on this slide, you'll see uh, some more information about it. Uh, it was recently, um, excuse me, it was released initially about a year ago, actually, in August 2019. Um, our roadmap identifies opportunities uh, that we can pursue that ensure technology innovation, uh, policies, procedures, uh, and our programs all benefit public safety over the next five and, and now four years. Um, the idea and the need for the roadmap was born out of the requirement that the FirstNet Authority reinvest FirstNet spectrum leasing fees back into the network. Um, so of the billions of dollars available for this reinvestment, um, it's really not the only benefit of the roadmap process. Um, so on this slide, you can see the six domains of the roadmap, um, and we like to describe these as the areas that, in conjunction with public safety and industry, um, network work and network enhancements are, are bucketed. Um, we have the FirstNet core, we have coverage and capacity, we have situational awareness, voice communication, secure information exchange, and finally, user experience. Uh, each of these domains represents an area that, you know, we think and, and have learned uh, is critical to public safety communications and operations. Um, you'll see that each domain has a handful of technologies within it. Uh, these technologies encompass all of the input that we collected um, and a potential area for, for us to dedicate resources, again, be that dollars or staff time, programs, policies. Uh, and we're proud that in just the first year of working with this living document, we have created uh, engagements that focus on each of these domains and allow us to have targeted specific conversations with public safety about the underlying technology that, that they need really to do their jobs. Um, we've had great success uh, with discussing a variety of technology ideas uh, from macro coverage to in-building coverage um, and then recently to location services, ICAM, um, and the use of public safety apps. Um, this organization um, into domains re really does guide the FirstNet Authority's work, um, and I, I know that our team has already put quite a bit um, into the network enhancements, uh, which is what I'll highlight on the next couple of slides. So I also wanted to share uh, some of these hard numbers um, that really go back to the success of not only the FirstNet Authority, um, but also AT&T. Um, this graphic, uh, we call it the FirstNet Momentum graphic, uh, I think it's a great way to give a quick update on the success of FirstNet to date, really. So in just three short years, I think we have quite a bit to be proud of. 
Uh, we have over 1.5 million connections across 13,000 public safety agencies. Uh, we have more than 100 unique apps in the FirstNet app catalog. Uh, and I stated 205 devices earlier, which is a good reminder to update the number uh, in the right-hand corner, as it says here, 100 plus. Um, so I am going to mention it a little bit um, more in detail, but for now, I'm going to skip the deployable number. Uh, I have a slide on just that in a second. Uh, and I understand this group is pretty interested in hearing more about that topic. Um, so this kind of momentum is, it is something we're very proud of, naturally, um, but it's just a high level snapshot, really, of all the network benefits we could dive into today. Um, since I know we have a couple of presentations and a lot more information, um, I'll move on to um, specify some of those benefits and highlight how we worked with public safety to get there. So really, anytime we're pointing to network benefits, um, we like to highlight that they're directly derived from this input that I keep referencing. Um, I can't stress enough how important that is. Uh, it is our driving force and always will remain so. Um, so this rather extensive suite of network benefits shows sort of how broadly we work to capture input uh, into the network. Um, really, everything from service plans uh, to the kind of newly named FirstNet Central um, was done directly in collaboration with users and stakeholders. Um, once we collect this input, we're able to analyze how to best translate the, uh, the operational needs or the suggestions that we receive into real-time improvements um, or new products and services. Um, I'll actually point back to the, the service plans as we've worked with at and over the last couple of years to really mature um, a lot of those models, including the subscriber paid model. Um, we've also worked to bring in the, the app developer community to create, um, design, and then eventually publish apps that public safety has specified that they need. Um, there are several challenges, obviously, um, done in coordination with PSCR and NIST. Um, that our FirstNet app developer program supports. Uh, and that kind of innovation or those kinds of challenge events uh, are really a direct result of the roadmap's forward-looking innovation. Um, and I think kind of unique in its method of bringing together you know, two communities, one being public safety and the other being app developers, that not, um, not always see eye to eye you know, traditionally. Um, so all of these things uh, that you see up here um, on the, the right are handled by our internal um, FirstNet Authority product team. Um, they collectively have decades of experience with telecom and with public safety, uh, and they use that expertise to work with AT&T on a daily basis uh, to develop and, and innovate new, new products and new services. Um, they create a common, or, yeah, common understanding um, of current and future network solution capabilities across the authority um, and I think that when you couple that with kind of the consistent messaging um, that goes out to public safety in, in venues just like today, we're really hoping that that produces results that are clearly visible to the customers and the users of the network. Um, so we think that, you know, this is a pretty impressive list for, for just a year or so. Um, and I'm really hoping that the next time we're here, um, you know, with this group or in a setting like this, um, not only will we have learned more, but we'll have even more to report. Um, you'll also see uh, here that we have worked with the entities um, on the left-hand side of this slide, um, on the arrow, to enhance and mature the deployable program. Uh, we are we're really proud of the, the hundreds of successful deployments to date, um, and I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say, especially on a day like today, um, where we all know that you know Louisiana and Texas um, are in need of communication support uh, for their responders. So. We have team members down there that are, of course, in all, in all of our thoughts. Um, and we don't have any specific information related to current events, but I'm sure in the near future we will. Uh, and I think on that note, I will dive a little bit more into the deployable uh, program itself. Um, so the, this program has, has really been quite a gem uh, of the overall FirstNet and AT&T work. Um, our solution included, um, all users have access to the 72 dedicated FirstNet deployables. Uh, those are strategically positioned um, across the country um, to provide coverage wherever necessary. And they also have satellite and terrestrial, excuse me, backhaul capability. 
Um, as I mentioned, there are 72 band 14 enabled set cult assets um, that are available. We also have three flying cell on wheels or cows uh, and one aerostat, which is a blimp. Um, that one's relatively new within the last year. Um, to date, I don't believe that we have much more information on the deployment, but again, happy to keep everybody posted. Um, FirstNet customers or users uh, at the agency level can request these assets uh, to support operational you know, requirements where basically there's just no terrestrial coverage, um, either in an emergency situation or during a planned event. Uh, and that can be done, again, via FirstNet.com and cause it calling FirstNet support. Um, as you also may have seen, um, the initial investment uh, approved in just this past June by our board of directors uh, and driven um, directly from our, our coverage and capacity roadmap domain um, included enhancements to help meet the increasing demand for these deployable assets. So we're very excited that that's part of our initial investment um, and really is, is again, a you know, result of the previous successes of this deployable program. So again, shifting, uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, I did hear uh, that uh, user eligibility is a topic of particular interest to this group. Um, so high level uh, on this slide, you'll see that we really have two types of users. We have extended primary and primary. Um, and I know most of this group uh, falls into the extended primary category. So um, AT&T is contractually responsible for operating the network uh, and an important piece of that is implementing and managing the eligibility framework for FirstNet users uh, through our, our being the FirstNet authorities, continued engagement. Uh, we provide feedback to AT&T that has informed and will continue to inform um, AT&T's updated eligibility framework. Um, as the framework continues uh, to evolve, um, I think I can share that the last um, the last document that we, we have is from earlier this year. I believe it's February 2020. Um, and one of the things that we always encourage, you know, really with extended primary users um, are the relationships with all of their public safety counterparts. Um, our team, you know, specifically does work with governance bodies and, and similar authority groups uh, across the country to ensure that the inclusiveness of the FirstNet eligibility or FirstNet users is always factored into emergency communication plans and planning. Uh, we know how critical transportation services are, um, and you know, we've heard a lot and, and believe firmly that you know, quite often you're the first on the scene, um, and sometimes you know, clear the way for other responders who may or may not even be able to arrive on scene otherwise. And so again, we always point back to being inclusive in plans and planning. And so the other area uh, that I understand uh, we wanted to touch on today um, is service plans. Um, so again, I have a little bit of information. Um, I, we can try and answer some questions, um, but I would also use this uh, to make kind of a plug for anyone interested in specifics uh, to go to firstnet.com. Um, so the rate, uh, the rate plans are you know, competitive, they're flexible, um, with rates offered to federal, state, and local authorities. Um, we have worked with AT&T uh, across the board to create a variety of procurement and contract options, um, which again is the result or, or due to the fact that we heard from the field that these overly complicated and lengthy or cumbersome, cumbersome procurement processes are a total deal breaker. Um, so the, the couple of uh, vehicles that I would highlight are the National Association of State Procurement Officers, uh, National Purchasing Partners, GSA Schedule 70, um, or really custom, custom contracts. Um, there is, of course, the one big question is who pays the bill, right? Um, AT&T uh, FirstNet also offers uh, flexibility in the both agency paid and subscriber paid, uh, recognizing that you know, all different sorts of public safety agencies have kind of varying financial arrangements with their staff, um, and so that is, that is why we have those two options. So then, again, shifting gears, um, my last slide, um, really a, a topic that's kind of closest to my heart uh, and one that I understand this group has an interest in, um, our PSAC uh, and our engagement with certain public safety associations. 
Um, so the act that created the First Note Authority uh, required the establishment of the Peace Act, uh, and the current Peace Act has 44 representatives um, from associations uh, from all disciplines of public safety, as well as local, state, territorial, tribal, and federal governments. Uh, the Peace Act is led by a seven-member executive committee, uh, which includes our Peace Act chairman. Uh, and as I've mentioned, Russ is your representative on the Peace Act. Um, so if, if you're really curious, a full membership list is available at firstnet.gov, uh, which is the FirstNet Authority site. So again, I, I do feel very lucky um, to work so closely with the Peace Act in my role. Um, it, you know, me and, and my team the opportunity to engage in such a wide swath of public safety expertise. Um, without all of this, I, I don't think we would be here um, today uh, without their input and their, their guidance. So we're always very appreciative. Um, and I do know, too, that the, uh, the NICSWIC, or the National Council um, of Statewide Interoperability Coordinators, um, is of particular interest, which is, is great. Um, our PSEC chair for the last two years has actually been the NICSWIC representative, uh, Todd Early, who is also the Texas WIC and the SPOC. Um, I think that Todd's leadership of the PSAC has been just unparalleled um, and has been so critical to the many recent successes of the group. Um, he has also, I would say, in his role as the, the NICSWIC representative, brought a ton of input from the National Council to our attention, which we, again, very much appreciate. Um, Jackie and I have, have been interacting with the NICSWIC and the SafeCom community consistently over the last couple of years. Um, as we actually both came to the authority um, from working with both of those groups in various roles. Um, I know that many of you, you know, engage your with a wide swath of communications issues, and we encourage you to continue to do so. Um, SPOC, similarly, uh, can be a great resource. Um, we're appreciative of all of the early work that the SPOCs were kind of a critical or crucial part of, uh, from initial consultation all the way up to data collection. Um, to our state plan kickoff meeting in, in the summer of 2017. Um, the list of SPOCs remains maintained at firstnet.gov, and you can find it under the Public Safety tab. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware that the, the State and Local Implementation Grant Program, commonly known as SLIGP, um, which funded the SPOCs from 2013 on, is now in its second iteration, SLIGP 2.0, um, and these funds are set to expire in early 2021. Um, as, as of, I think, early 2018, uh, 46 of the 56 eligible states and territories had been awarded SLIGP 2.0 funds, um, but that program was managed by NTIA, um, which we are an independent authority you know, within. Um, but of course, our, our public safety advocacy team does work um, very closely with the SPOCs and with NTIA on education and outreach initiatives under the grant. Our field team, I can say, still regularly you know, coordinates with the SPOCs, work with the SPOCs. Many of them have weekly or biweekly or monthly uh, touch points with the SPOCs and their teams. So if anyone has a, a question about a specific state or a specific SPOC, um, please don't hesitate to contact me or Jackie, and we can get you in touch um, with the right field staff and or kind of the SPOC um, based on your location and your question. Um, so that is all I have for today. Uh, I will turn it back to Russ uh, for a few questions if we have time uh, before we hear from Ryan. So thanks again, and sorry for going over a few minutes. Thanks, Kenzie. And yeah, we have a little bit of time. But uh, like Kenzie mentioned, uh, we also have on the webinar from FirstNet is Jackie Miller Waring. And Jackie is the uh, Director of Central Area Field Operations. So Kenzie or Jackie should be able to answer hopefully some of these questions. So, so the first one we have is, does the system support traffic control devices? I can go ahead and take that one. This is Jackie. Um, there, it, it's not a simple yes or no question. Um, there is uh, the use of those traffic control caverns and how you're using them, whether they're in a primary capacity or an extended primary capacity. In a primary capacity, we're using, to, using the traffic control system to control lights for public safety. Um, and those types of things, um, it's an automatic eligibility. Um, if it's for the extended primary use and some of those other things, we do have to go through um, a validation process, and that goes through an eligibility board on the extended primary side. All right. Thanks, Jackie. And the next one mm -hmm. we have is from uh, Greg Chapman. He wants to know if he wants to basically does how many DOTs are using FirstNet? Do we have a number or a percentage? Do you know? Oh, and, and I wish I had that number off the top of my head. Um, I, I was thinking about how the information is categorized on 
some subscription reports and things that we get. While we can't share specific subscriber information about this specific agency subscribes, we can get you some total numbers. And I should have thought about that before this call, and I didn't. And I didn't. But I can make sure um, that I can get you uh, a total number of the, the number of users that we have in that extended primary category for our uh, uh, Department of Transportation across the country. All right. I'm trying to thanks. get it now, but no guarantees they'll get it before the end of the call. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jackie. And now we'll do one more. And the last one was from uh, Edward Mark, and he basically wants to ask, is uh, the FirstNet application be designed to permit you know, access to first-slash-secondary response incident reporting using the, you know, the web client systems? So I'm, I'm thinking that's a situational awareness type application that's uh, uh, they're looking to be developed. There are some of them out there already, and there is a development process um, for developing new applications um, to be um, uh, certified for the FirstNet uh, system. We do have an app catalog um, that lists applications in two different categories, and then we also have a program for application development. So if there's an interest in that, we can follow up and, and uh, share with you the applications that exist today um, and the process for developing new applications. Okay, thank you. Um, as far as the other questions and answers, we'll uh, cover that at the end of the session. So we'll move on to the next uh, presenter. So um, our next presenter is Ryan Folterman from, of Comdex. Uh, Ryan has been involved in the mission critical communications for more than a decade in design and consulting roles. He is the vice chair of the MLR LTE Working Group of the National Public Safety Telecommunications Council an organization that focuses on public safety interoperability. He is also the innovation architect at Convex, responsible for the next generation public safety designs. Go ahead, Ryan. Thank you, and thank you for having me here. So part of the basis for this is stemming from the uh, NCHRP 03-129, which basically resulted in the book Blue Book, Wireless Communications for Public Agencies. It will be published by the National Academy of Science soon. The downloadable version from NES will be free. AASHTO intends to publish as well. And it's centered around plain, simple language with real-world experiences and diagrams to simplify the complex. For those who want to learn more, because there's entire books been written about some of the topics, I included deeper dive links for more information. And the table of contents acts as a reminder of key concepts for people short on time. So this is a quick summary of the different topics that are covered, and I'm not going to go too far into it. Um, but there are additional topics that aren't covered in this as well. Resulting from the COVID-19 issues that are going on with people, we created the basically a spreadsheet that has the different manufacturer-approved disinfection methods for radio, smartphones, first net devices, and dispatch equipment and computers. It's already available at the link above, and also the direct link is also included. I can also create an Excel file and send it to people as well as needed. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the hand sanitizer recall. There have been over 100 brands right now that have been recalled by the FDA. Most of them are made in Mexico, but um, if you get the PDF of the slides, be sure to click on that link and make sure that the hand sanitizers at your home, at your work, and anywhere in between are not on that list. So I'm a firm believer in cellular technology, and I think it requires an open mind, realistic expectations, and an understanding of performance. And it's really a shift from voice only to voice, data, and video. If a picture is worth a thousand words, how long does it take to do the equivalent on a radio? And the answer is about five and a half minutes, depending on how fast you speak. Smartphones present cybersecurity risks, which is a, represents a fundamental change in how things are done. You have to actively manage the, the device and make sure it's being updated. Certain devices by certain manufacturers aren't being updated in terms of vulnerabilities as much as they should be. And be careful on comparing the direct power output from a radio versus a cell phone. The radio power output is at the antenna connector, and portable radio antennas lose power. Cell phone power output is actually from the antenna. Now keep in mind that the cell phones may reduce the power for FCC limits with specific absorption rates. 
basically safety reasons. Now let's do a quick comparison of the towers. On the radio site, this is fairly typical. You have one transmit antenna, one receive antenna, and some microwave. The cell site, this is a pretty basic cell site. It's actually got three antennas per side, and each one is actually acting as its own site. But we'll get into that in a moment. So the radio site, it's basically providing coverage to everybody. Whereas the cell site, and this is an even more simplified version than the site you just saw, it splits it up into sectors or different areas. So to the cell site, each one is its own site. And you notice how what, what I'll call area one at the top has the most amount of people. They're seeing the slowest speed. And then when you get to the second sector, well, there's less people there than the first one, so they're getting better speed. And the third one, there's a lot of not a lot of people, so they're getting the most amount of speed. So the performance that you might see from a cell site may vary based on what side of the cell site you're on. Site resiliency, fairly consistent design criteria for LMR or radio, traditionally with the UPS, traditionally with the generator, minimum run times, mandated, and there are site hardening requirements. With cellular, it really depends on the carrier. Typically, it has a UPS, small cells being a, an, a, an important exception. It may not necessarily have a generator and may not have minimum ride times, and it may not be hardened. For those interested in learning more, I would definitely take a look at, um, sorry, I'm going off of memory, but it was a California filing where you can get some more information on how each carrier is approaching the hardening of the sites. There are key differences in coverage, especially with coverage maps. With a radio, you are doing a map for a specific device. It factors in the user. Are they wearing it? Is it on their vehicle? Is it in their hand? Is it on their hip? The coverage map is, uh, sorry, single frequency for each one. And the coverage map is for each type of modulation. Now, when I say modulation, um, for trunking, you have FDMA and TDMA. So if you're not in that land, don't worry about it. The coverage is static. It doesn't change. And then traditionally, there's coverage obligations. You have commitments by the manufacturer, the person who installed the system, that they would meet these requirements for coverage. Cellular maps don't quite match in that. It's a generic device. It doesn't factor the user in at all. It may combine frequency bands to show coverage. And the bandwidth may not match the user's requirements or needs. And coverage can change based on the usage of the system. If you start getting too many set, uh, users on the site and it gets overloaded, it may start shedding the cover, coverage and shedding the fur users furthest out. So this is kind of the coverage breeds, so to speak. And it may be optimistic. So if you are interested in that, be sure to look at that report. And it's, and it's important to m mention that AT&T was not dinged on that one. There were a number of other carriers were not, but the FCC actually said that the maps were more realistic for AT&T. So I went into this a while back with the expectation that the coverage of AT&T and FirstNet would be the same. And I had heard reports to the contrary. So I decided to pick a random area on the map. I chose Reno, Nevada, and I did this in December. And what I'd like you to do is just take a quick look at the map and see if you can spot the differences. Now, ignore the orange on the right. That's just a Native American reservation. But see if you can spot the differences. And I'll give you another couple seconds to take a look. So where the arrows are and where the, the brown is, that's where the coverage differences lie. AT&T has more coverage than FirstNet does. And I'm not going to speculate why but I can just say that there is. Now, the other important thing to mention is that this is a fairly remote areas. So just check your area, see if you're impacted, and be sure to test with the first net sim to make sure that the coverage is what you expect it to be. Band 14, there's a lot of fuss about it, but it's a little overblown. It's a 700 megahertz spectrum, and I'll say that's enough about that. 
But public agencies don't have exclusive use of Band 14. They never have, even in the initial RFP. And FirstNet uses all AT&T bands. Now, if you're doing in-building coverage, then this can cause some surprises for you because mandates are appearing for just Band 14 coverage. But if it's just repeating the outside signal, then it's repeating the AT&T signal as well as the FirstNet signal. This isn't like a radio system DAS where it's just exclusively for the radio users. And this may be different for cell sites installed within a building. High power user equipment for band 14, this will not be seen in any smartphones. It, it's not designed for it and it's not meant for it. Now I did ask the question during IWCE to the FirstNet CEO if they're planning on creating a version for smartphones and he said he'd look into it. And, uh, if I hear anything, I'll be sure to share it. But HPUE was actually first deployed in the US by Sprint, 2.5 gigahertz, and theirs does support smartphones. Now, the standard output for a cell phone is technically 200 milliwatts. And because of the, the tolerances allowed, you can get up to 250 milliwatts, sometimes even 300. Band 14, you can use 1.25 watt maximum. Now, it's not actually the highest that you can get in the US. The FCC recently approved 900 megahertz for three watts. Uh, 2.5 gigahertz could be used for WiMAX, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, technically, since Sprint and T-Mobile combined, it wouldn't necessarily be Sprint, but yes, they sold on that spectrum. And be sure to watch out for GPS interference on vehicles. Don't, yes, GPS interference. So just be sure to not install these too close to, if you want to use HPUEN vehicles, make sure to keep it a good distance from the GPS antennas. There is a 3GPP technical report, and when I look it up, when I'm not talking, I will send it in the chat. But there is a, a risk of it. It's second order. So this is always a fun topic, mission critical push to talk. Um, we're going to say that it's called person at PTT and AT&T. There are two providers. One is called Kodiak, which is Motorola Solutions now, and the other one which has been selected but not announced. And it's basically people know who it is at this point. It's already in active use in other countries. Yeah, I will. We'll replace LMR for your European public safety and LTE R for European railroads. And so here's where the problem with ProSay lies if you're interested in it. Qualcomm, who makes most of the smartphones, the processors and the modems, they don't make it. They haven't included it. In Samsung is the only one who has because they made their modem themselves. And I'll try to speed up, but the FCC petition, as a disclaimer, I as an individual filed. Um, I think that there should be interoperability, particularly in disaster situations. You know, hurricanes and other sort of natural disasters don't necessarily care whose cell tower they hit. So um, there's been no decision on the reopening of it. MCPTT standards allow for secure interoperability. Europe intends to have seamless integration, Korea will use multiple carriers, Canada will use multiple carriers, and even Finland will be using multiple carriers. For MCT PTT consoles, it's not clear how the consoles will connect. There are a number of interfaces available, and it will depend on the carrier's policy. There's different requirements in order to connect it. NIPSTIC has created a console report, and we are assisting with the, a control room implementation guide to give some people some guidance. So LMR, LTE working together, the cheapest is the donor radio. And if you're using radio over IP, it's the same thing. ISSI connection is expensive but flexible, and the interwork working function isn't available yet. So a lot of people have been comparing MCPTT versus over the top. MCPTT is new, open standard, highest network priority. It can be interoperable. The information is contained with the carrier. When you go to an over the top, it's been around for years, it's proprietary. There may be an appearance of competition that isn't actually there. And it's carrier agnostic, so it can be used on any. So for 5G, my answer is just ignore the hype. 
there's a lot of hype focused around it, and it, it's a, a lot of it is the same promise as the 4G promised, and now given a higher number. There are two categories, commonly called sub-6 and millimeter wave. Those are the actual ranges. AT&T calls it 5G and 5G+. Plus. Um, it's just a marketing term. If you have the sub-6, then it's going to have a little, basically the similar performance to LTE. Millimeter wave is extremely fast, but at extremely short range. It can be blocked by hands, walls, glass. And the major benefits won't be seen until the carrier's core architecture is replaced. So in summary, if you're still using HF, most likely you're looking at low Earth orbit satellite long term. It'll provide the, the sort of latency that you care about and the amount of coverage that you care about. VHF, you're probably staying using radios long term. UHF, it depends on if you're urban or rural. I would say urban, you're going to go cellular. 7800 megahertz, you're probably going cellular because indoor location is a thing. You might have more access to data, and that could be very important, especially with transit. You know, if you're checking, if you're sending the location of the bus every 30 seconds or so, then why not just put the, the PTT on top of it? And budgets may influence the decision. When you already have a constrained budget and then you have something like COVID-19 happens and your operational and personnel expenses go up because of isolation costs and other stuff like that and drops in revenue, it, it's going to be harder to maintain LMR in the long term. So that has an impact. And that's the last of my slides. So thank you very much for your time. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Uh, next we have, um, right now Ryan was able to answer some of the questions. And so um, we're going to move on to our next two presenters. So our final speakers are Jeanette Frankel and David Chase, who will provide an overview of their experience using FirstNet to support DOT operations. Uh, a little bit of bio on both of them is Janet Frankel serves on the Maryland Department of Transportation State Highway Administration as the Deputy Director uh, for ITS and Special Projects for the Office of Transportation Mobility and Operation. Janet is currently the co-chair of the ASHTO CTSO Working Group on Communication Technology and is the ASHTO Alternative Voting Member for the NIPSTEC Governing Board. David Chase is the Communication Supervisor at the New Hampshire DOT Bureau of TSML, supporting statewide Communications for Intelligent Traffic Transportation Systems and LL LMR. Uh, Dave serves on the New Hampshire Statewide Interoperability Executive Committee and on the FCC Region 19, 700 megahertz to 800 megahertz and the 4.9 gigahertz Frequency Coordination Committee. He is a veteran of the U.S. Air Force and has worked at the New Hampshire DOT since 2002. So Janet, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for um, listening here to the state of Maryland and our use of the FirstNet capability to enhance transportation systems operations. And I just want to thank NOCO and ASHTO for hosting this today, as well as FirstNet for such great participation. So we all know that around 2017, um, the FirstNet initiative came through, and in Maryland, Governor Hogan accepted the FirstNet and AT&T plan and helped connect first responders to secure information in Maryland, um, which also allowed us to create efficient communications experience to increase public safety coverage, enhance and expand network coverage, and provide first responders with access to dedicated assets, as well as driving infrastructure investments and creating new jobs. So overall, it was a, certainly a win, a win for Maryland. And one of the unique strategies that was used um, locally was to connect the need to utilize FirstNet to the Maryland Governor's Office of Homeland Security, GOHF, in their strategy, which is um, currently posted on the Governor's website. So Cornerstone 2 was a, a, a goal overall, not specific to FirstNet, to enable improved communication and information sharing through the use of interoperable, interoperable platforms to, util, excuse me, to unify the effort of public safety partners in Maryland. And objective four was specific to public safety 
um, response here. So GOHS will ensure that Maryland state agencies with public safety missions complete Im implementation of public safety grade communications technology to increase the reliability of cellular communication during emergencies. And um, what was specific to the state of Maryland in terms of the design? Was the expanded coverage in Western and the Lower Eastern Shore of the state? Um, there was absolute need for uh, additional cellular coverage there specific to FirstNet to focus on the state's critical infrastructure in preparation for severe weather events to make solutions available to support the state's large base of volunteer emergency responders. And some of the evacuation routes for the nation's capital bring citizens into the state of Maryland. And you can look into that a little bit more yourself at hcma.dc.gov. So some more specific details in terms of Maryland's FirstNet program. Um, it, essentially, the program is in a pilot stage at this point. Um, so we're expanding the program, and, and we're doing so incrementally. We've deployed band 14 modems with the black SIM cards for ITS infrastructure. We have cellular phones and wireless hotspots set up for the state DOT. The State Highway Admi in Administration, SHA, is working with AT&T and FirstNet to establish an APN. The potential to utilize push to talk from cellular devices to LMR. Um, so we're exploring that as well with AT&T and FirstNet. And access to asset deployment for major events with anticipated increased communication needs. And then a mobile app for FirstNet to assist us with support as well is also available. And the coverage map here, um, at first, it takes a moment to, because all the colors here, all the blue colors are kind of similar. Um, but take a look at band 14 coverage, um, which is the dark blue and the medium blue here. And then there's just a few areas that are pending coverage in the state. So you also see some neighboring states in the edges of the map here. But um, essentially, that blue outline all the way around is the state of Maryland, if you're not super familiar. And just to summarize, um, again, it's, we're kind of a, still in the beginning of adopting the program, but really been relatively successful overall with what we have adopted. And we're getting a lot of support, both from the national and the local FirstNet and AT&T um, representatives as well. So that's been wonderful in terms of the response there. Um, and as budget allows, we will continue to increase the number of devices with FirstNet. Um, some benefits and challenges, absolutely. But overall, again, the team has certainly helped SHA achieve its goals. Um, and just to kind of give a little bit more detail for anyone with questions, especially in the state of Maryland, I just received an update recently with a little bit more detail about coverage than you could see in the map. So I'll just kind of read through that. But if anyone has questions, they could certainly reach out. Um, so Charles County has some new coverage and enhanced coverage. PG County has enhanced coverage. Frederick County has enhanced coverage. And um, there's a little bit more interoperability and connection with the state of Pennsylvania, one of our neighbors. The eastern shore of Maryland has enhanced coverage. The western shore and Montgomery County both have enhanced coverage as well. And just to wrap up here, um, again, really excited to be part of this program and, and also part of um, sharing with our partners in terms of the AASHTO, NOCO um, presence here, and also partnering with FirstNet. Thank you all very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can, can you hear me OK? Loud and clear. All right, thank you. Um, 
Yes, Good afternoon. Um, I'm pleased to present uh, to the group. Um, I, was, I was happy to be asked because I think uh, we do have some information uh, we can share about our first net um, in ways that we're using it now that people may not have, have thought of yet or, or aren't, aren't doing or is on their horizon. So um, with that, um, this is a quick reference uh, to New Hampshire and our density of ITS devices and where our divided highways lie and the type of communications we're using for ITS devices. Um, I'm going to use the pointer here. So if you want to follow me on the pointer, uh, for reference, here's the border with the state of Maine, uh, the border with uh, Massachusetts, and then the Connecticut River Valley with the border of Vermont. Um, our highest population density in the state is in the two counties in the southeast portion, um, thus the high density of uh, ITS devices to manage traffic. Um, in the more rural sections of our divided highways, you'll see a lot of red dots, which represent cell modems, uh, because we've not invested in the, the communications infrastructure along uh, those corridors yet. Um, so uh, we do share a microwave system with some other state agencies that has allowed for, for us to do some, some remote connectivity to, to some, some of these areas. Uh, but some of them are, are far from our highways, or they're just in areas that that haven't warranted putting it in ITS devices yet. So in 2019, we were faced with a bunch of modems that were going to be obsolete because the incumbent carrier had decided to retire 3G service. So we needed to buy new hardware uh, to overcome the obsolescence. And we considered at the time using um, uh, FirstNet as a carrier. So uh, we worked with um, our local reps from FirstNet and an AT&T engineer to build a virtual private network within their core uh, to communicate from our data center through their core, through their RAN, to ITS devices. Um, we were able to use a Class C network of, of address space that we could provide them and then manage ourselves uh, with, with our devices. It, it's worked out quite well. It's very secure, as, as people alluded to earlier, that, that the network is very secure. A lot of, a lot of thought has gone into that. We have uh, two uh, redundant um, VPNs to their data centers, and they also have redund redundancy between theirs. Um, so so we're, we're fairly sure that uh, if, if there's a problem that develops, we, we would still have connectivity. Uh, most of our devices are Ethernet ready or native Ethernet, so uh, using a data motor with them is, is uh, apart from the work that the, the network people have to do, is, is pretty much a plug and play operation. So we have a purpose built um, access point name within their network. Um, we have VPN tunnels. We also have user control over those endpoints um, with the user portal to be able to dis disable modems or or check on their status um, and the amount of data use um, through those. This, again, is a quick reference map, map to uh, demonstrate where we have um, 37 LMR repeaters um, at 17 sites. And I would draw your attention to these little red icons. I know this is very difficult to see. But uh, we have a statewide dispatch located in central New Hampshire. And then we have uh, six district dispatches that all use LMR radio to talk to the, the crews in the field. Um, I want to point out two examples where this dispatch in Lancaster does not have line of sight to this repeater site here. So they have a, a remote radio they remotely control to, to, to gain access to, to this repeater here. Uh, the same is true in District 2. They have a hilltop remote controlled radio to speak through this repeater uh, that's located in Windsor, Vermont. So uh, use of FirstNet for, for LMR. Um, this is a depiction of what those two dispatch centers have at the moment. Um, they have Y2K error technology for remote control into a 100-year-old uh, landline local phone company to remotely operate a radio base on a very limited functionality basis. So enter FirstNet. Um, with radio coverage from their RAN, we're now able to deploy modems to this 
this uh, Y2K technology, along with a gateway, communicate through their RAN to remotely control um, the radio. You, it doesn't look like that would be significant, but that, that allows and opens the opportunities to do other things. Um, it allows a migration path for a digital technology in the district office. It also allows for this remote radio to perhaps be moved to a different location that is easier to access, easier to maintain, uh, perhaps on a property that you don't have to lease. So there's a cost savings factor that could come into play um, by leveraging um, the wireless connectivity. There's also a reliability uh, aspect in that landlines are, are susceptible to ice storms, uh, traffic accidents, hurricanes, uh, weather events, fallen trees. So, so that, that is all overcome with uh, using wireless connectivity. Uh, this is a quick overview of our statewide dispatch. Uh, we have in, in Concord uh, the Transportation Management Center. There's 15 local base stations with line of sight connectivity to the, to the repeaters that we're seeing on that map. Uh, we have two remote sites ourselves uh, to overcome some line of sight issues to reach into portions of the state that don't have line of sight from Concord. And then we have a, the shared microwave system that was on an earlier slide that is shared. And, it goes out to, to some of the repeaters. Um, with the use of FirstNet, um, it, it may allow for phase migration of the, the ROIP system, replacing certain portions of the microwave system. Um, this, this leg here is DOT owned, not shared, um, and has a, a life cycle uh, issue with it right now and that we have to replace it. We may consider replacing it with modems. Um, Next slide. Use the FirstNet RAN for LMR. Uh, again, this, this allows for uh, conversion of analog dispatch to, to digital. You can see our, our digital, uh, district office has decided to migrate to a, a radio over IP platform with its own gateway communicating again through the RAN network to a remote radio um, through a repeater to the, to the end users. Um, again, if, if you can communicate to this remote radio through a modem, there's no reason you can't communicate directly to the repeater. So again, it, it eliminates equipment and cost expense. Um, the, the other thing about a district office is that it could subscribe to the uh, APN cloud within the network that, that we created, uh, becoming perhaps a eighth console for our, our central dispatch or a key element in our coop planning if uh, we're short staffed anywhere or, or if a facility becomes uh, uh, non-occupiable for, for some reason. We, we can uh, network through using radio over IP. Uh, in, in our lab, we have um, mocked up the replacement of the phone line, and we've, we've actually demonstrated that we're able to, to connect uh, a remote console through, through the, the cloud to our, uh, our radio assets in the field. Um, this next slide is more visionary um, in what can be done in the, in the future, um, given, given the technology at hand. Um, there is the uh, enhanced push to talk uh, web application that um, that Ryan uh, spoke about. Um, it can operate in parallel with the, the radio for IP um, platform that we're using um, to communicate uh, with, with our LMR system. E each platform can through, through uh, its own gateway attached to a, to a donor radio as, a, as it was referred to earlier. It also creates uh, cross-banding from, from your, your existing LMR system to push to talk phones. So you could have uh, uh, each, each type of asset out there uh, deployed, and it allows you to perhaps phase, phase uh, replacement of uh, certain elements of your LMR system uh, by relying on, on the, the push-to-talk phones instead of the LMR while, while updates are done or replacements are done or, or elimination is done. So um, in, in conclusion, you know, 
uh, leveraging the, the FirstNet public safety broadband network uh, increases the chances of uh, deploying ITS into rural remote areas that, that may not be currently in your ITS master plan. There just may not be that justification to invest in, in infrastructure or leases or all, all the costs associated with, with deploying uh, you know, a broadband uh, communication system to an area without high density of ITS devices. Uh, the the uh, first net modems uh, work perfectly for, for those remote areas, uh, provided the coverage is there. Um, it reduces the cost of communications infrastructure. Um, it uh, could reduce uh, the cost of maintenance and operation of a cell phone network. network. Um, it may be a lower cost option for uh, communications equipment life cycle replacement. Um, it may lower the cost option for um, LMR, uh, subscriber units. Um, it's uh, definitely an increased security over uh, traditional uh, cellular carriers. Um, and uh, I think you could think first as a first net as a wireless computer Ethernet jack anywhere you want it. So that's all I've got, Russ. Uh, I will hand it back to you. All right. Th thanks, Dave, and uh, thanks, Janet. Uh, great presentations. Uh, so I want to thank all the speakers uh, for sharing the information about FirstNet and its, you know, applicability to the DOT operations. I think it's uh, widely uh, due as far as uh, DOTs need to know what FirstNet can do for us. Um, now we'll have a question and answer session uh, facilitated, by, facilitated by myself along with Ferdinand and Janet, who are the co-chairs of the ASHTO Working Group, you know, on com communication technology. So. Um, I know we've been answering some questions, but uh, we'll see what we'll open up the chat box here and see what we can answer. Um, I do see one out there. Um, it says, and maybe this I'll address this to uh, the FirstNet uh, crew. Has, has there been any user satis uh, satisfaction surveys uh, or coverage issues? Uh, Jackie, I can take that one if you'd like. Absolutely. Um, that's a great question. I thanks for catching that, Russ. I didn't um, didn't catch that on the chat. Um, so the <laughs> the short answer, um, since we only have a few few minutes left, is yes. Um, part of our um, team's uh, mission is to um, capture um, both public safety sentiment, um, positive and negative, um, as we're out engaging public safety. So as we do learn um, both, you know, positive user experiences or any issues with things like coverage, um, those are captured in terms of the first authority. Um, we make sure that those are logged properly. We address them as we can. Uh, and we also pass that information to our partner. So uh, yes, on both sides. All right, thanks, Kenzie. I, I'm looking as far as on the chat, it looks a lot, lot of, you know, looks like a lot of have already been addressed. Uh, Fernand or Janet, am I missing any? No. Um, uh, not that I, I I can see. It looks like we've answered the questions throughout the presentation. But seeing no questions, maybe I'd just like to add, just to make sure if, if the, the DOTs need to be engaged, know who to contact for your first net needs or questions. Um, hopefully, there's someone in your agency, in your organization, that knows about first net. Or you, you, you know your AT&T reps. There could be a different AT&T rep for normal AT&T services. Um, or, or, and and uh, specifically for FirstNet, know who your SPOC is, your single point of contact. Uh, the question about um, survey uh, coverage issues, uh, the SPOC should be your, is your liaison between you and FirstNet should there be any concerns or needs that are not being met by AT&T. So I encourage you all to make sure you, you're aware of who to contact. Uh, we provided the SWIC and SPOC listings for your information and hopefully you can find that a benefit. So Janet, you have anything to add? No, well said, Fernand. And um, we did answer a few questions in the chat. Um, but if anyone has anything later on or would like to share best practices or one state to another kind of experience, um, I would love to loop the FirstNet team into that, uh, to loop NOCO and ASHO into that. So feel free to reach out and we'll connect you to the, the right folks. Okay, I, I have also, this is Russ, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, Jackie pointed out, there is another question on eligibility so uh, of operations. So, J Jackie, go ahead. 
Um, so the question was related to DOT operations programs and the difference between primary and secondary eligibility uh, or primary and uh, extended primary eligibility. I just wanted to point out that there is a process for primary eligibility um, and and extended primary um, for determining the right place, but it really is related to the role that you perform, not necessarily the agency that you work for. So I know that many uh, DOTs across the country um, at all levels of government uh, manage their own emergency operations centers and those types of organizations. So again, it just really has to do with the role that you perform, not so much the agency that you report to. Great, appreciate it. Um, also, I have a question for David Chase. And as far as your, um, your your ITS operations plan, are you able to share that, or are you willing to share it with the other DOTs? Um, yes. Okay, appreciate it. Uh, J Janet, have we addressed uh, Robert uh, Rape's uh, last question there on the chat, or? I think you have. Never, uh, I'll disregard that. It, it was regarding uh, as far as uh, modals. So I see you addressed it. Hey, Russ. Uh, this is Ferdinand. Um, can I add one more thing? Um, Go the ahead. Deployables portion, the, the deployables that um, that Kenzie and Jackie spoke about are a great feature of uh, FirstNet. I just want to make sure the expectations are there's a limited amount of, of deployables per state. There's, uh, depending on each state, there's an agreement as to how long it will take those deploys, the deployables to get to your incident when you request it. So if you're, if you're actually um, planning to use those deployables, you need to know those, the process so that um, your expectations are met and that your, your, your incident response can be successful. Thanks, Russ. All right, thank you. And, and Ryan, I guess, can you expand you know, on the, uh, the 3GPP document as a reference? Yeah, so I sent it in the chat. Um, it is TR36.837, and I shared a link to it. Now, I, I do want to say that, yes, they talk about potential interference. It's a, for the RF people here, it's, it's a second order harmonic, so it's not like it's a third or a fifth. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind when you're installing the antennas, and it'll be interesting to see when we start seeing more HPUE devices, what sort of impact there is to antennas on a vehicle for GPS. Okay, I have a question for FirstNet, uh, the aerostat or the blimp. Um, what's the, as far as being in the air, is, there, is it endless or is there a time where it has to come down? What's its longevity as far as being in the sky at one time? Oh, that's a good question, Russ. Um, you know, I knew that number, and off the top of my head, it's not coming to me. Um, I want to say that it's, it is a day or so, but let me confirm that and get back to you. All right, appreciate it. Sure. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions. I think we, uh, we're hitting pretty much the time mark here pretty quick. Ross, I'm else? sorry. I was just, yep, it's Kenzie. I was just corrected by my teammates. Thank you guys very much. Uh, two weeks. I was way off. Two weeks? Okay, appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Okay, seeing no more questions in the chat box, I do want to thank everyone for joining us today for this uh, webinar on FirstNet. Again, uh, thanks for all the presenters for doing a great job and explaining what FirstNet is. I believe that you know, the DOT is extended, is my understanding, uh, but uh, DOT you know, has that preemptive service and it's ending encryption, so it's, which is great. And I, again, thanks to all the speakers, and this concludes the webinar, so have a great afternoon. And this, uh, any remarks from NOCO? Uh, Nilu? No, you all you covered it. Just a reminder that uh, this was recorded, and that recording and the slides will also be shared through the NOCO website. Okay, thank you, Nilu. So again, thank you for joining us, and I look forward to uh, those people that will be joining our working group and stuff. Uh, thanks for those that volunteered already, and we'll take as many as we can get from the other states. Thank you. <laughs>